Good morning and good day to everyone joining us here for this important discussion on the role of victims in the Afghan peace process. My name is Marika Tharos and I'm a senior fellow at the South Asia Center at the Atlantic Council. We're delighted to welcome today a distinguished panel of leaders with backgrounds in human rights, transitional justice and peace processes. Today we have with us Shahrzad Akbar, the chairperson for the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. She also previously served as deputy at the National Security Council on Peace and Civilian Protection. We also have with us Hadi Marifat, who is a human rights activist and the co-founder and director of the Afghanistan Human Rights and Democracy Organization, a civil society organization that works with victims of war and promotes democracy, human rights, and social justice. Lastly, I'm also pleased to introduce to you Sergio Jaramillo Caro, the former High Commissioner of Peace to Colombia. He is also a senior advisor today at the European Institute of Peace. To date, much of the discussion on reaching intra-Afghan negotiations has focused on getting the main parties to the conflict to the table, as well as on US troop numbers and withdrawal. We hope this panel can broaden the discussion to explore the role that victims or a victim-centered approach to peace can play in the intra-Afghan negotiations. Afghanistan's conflict is multidimensional and multi-generational. It spans four decades and has been devastating for the people of the country. A recurring trend has been widespread human rights violations, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and brutal violence. In just the decade that followed the Soviet invasion in 1979, more than 1.8 million people were killed, more than 1.6 million people disabled, and more than 7.5 million people forced to leave as refugees. In the last 20 years, since 2001 alone, at least 160,000 Afghans have been killed in the country. Today, some reports suggest that an average of 75 to 100 men, women, and children are killed daily. And in addition to the violence leveled against civilians are the indirect effects of war, which exacerbates the effects of poverty and destitution on Afghan health. But today, as Afghanistan looks to begin talks, we have yet to hear much about how victims will be meaningfully included in the process and how the future agreement might tackle questions of justice and impunity. Evidence from other contexts demonstrate how inclusive approaches that involve victims either in the process or in the content of the agreement can have positive impacts on sustainable peace. Our panelists today will look at what a victim-centered approach could look like in Afghanistan, why efforts to include victims in agreements have failed in the past, and what lessons can be drawn from Colombia's peace processes. But before we turn to the panelists, we're privileged today to be able to hear directly from two victims of Afghanistan's long conflict in a short video recording. The first video will be of Rehana Hashim, who lost her 15-year-old sister. Hello, this is Rehana Hashmi. I am 25 years old and living in Kabul. I lost my sister Atifa in 2018. She was 15 years old and still a school student. She had a great sense of poetry and wanted to become a poet and a writer in the future. The loss of Atifa was a devastating shock to my family. Everyone went into a long-term depression. I personally suffered from two years of depression after that. We didn't have the life we had before but no one asked what, what we were going through. Peace without victims, meaningful inclusion would mean nothing. Peace must bring a sense of normalcy and calm to my family and other families like us. Peace must heal, not add another injury to our wounds. Without listening to victims and including them, in the process, others will not understand what peace really means to those who have suffered the most, and I'm afraid it would fail us all again. Thank you. Thank you. And in the second video, we will be hearing from Hamadullah Rafi, who lost his 17-year-old sister in the conflict. Hello, this is Hamidullah Rafi, 27 years old, living in Kabul, Afghanistan. Over the past four decades, Afghanistan's civil war has taken hundreds of thousands of lives, and this war still continues. I lost my little sister Rahila in 2018 in a suicide bombing at an educational center in Kabul. Rahila was 17 years old, and she was studying for university entrance exam. I have personally gone through this pain and I am deeply familiar with the suffering and sorrows of other families who have lost dear ones to this vicious conflict. As a victim survivor, 
I want a victim center peace process in which victim voice are heard and taken into account for building a future free of violence and hatred. This peace process must endeavor to address all concerns of victim families and other vulnerable groups. And that is possible only if victims are included in all stages of the process. Unfortunately, it seems that the current peace process is not taking that direction. For example, in the 21-member peace negotiating delegation, there is no independent victims representative. Victims inclusion must be ensured from now and the commitment to their inclusion must continue several, several years even after a possible peace agreement is signed. All reconciliation programs must take this important issue into consideration and should be designed in a way to tackle all root causes of conflict and broaden victims access to their socio-economic rights and heal their psychological wounds. A victim-centered peace process requires a long-term commitment. I hope we see that long-term commitment in Afghanistan peace process. Thank you. I'd like to thank Rehana and Hamid for sharing their stories with us today and also to thank Hadi Marifat for making this possible. Hadi, you've been working with victims for many years now. Can you help us set the scene by giving us a bit of an overview of previous efforts in Afghanistan to include victims and to undertake transitional justice programs? Thank you so much, Marika, and thank you and the Atlantic Council for Atlantic Council for organizing this very important and very timely webinar on such an important and crucial issue as victim-centered peace building. To answer your question, the past defers to include victims in and undertake measures towards the transitional justice program should be divided into three phases. The first phase involves undertaking of concrete measures, which includes the conduct of a national consultation, the findings of which was established in a policy report in 2005 called for a call, call, a call for justice, where majority of Afghan victims asked for a transitional justice process. Based on the findings of this consultation, Afghanistan Peace, Reconciliation and Justice Program, otherwise known as the Action Plan on Transitional Justice, was developed. This phase demonstrated a positive environment where key actors such as the Afghan government, the United Nations Assistant Mission for Afghanistan and the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission and many diplomatic actors were determined to implement the action plan on transitional justice in Afghanistan. The second phase is literally the reversal of the first phase where the Afghan government under Hamid Karzai backed off from implementing the action plan. The Afghan government and the jihadi group mobilized against it and drafted a national amnesty bo uh, bill to kill the action plan. Unfortunately, Hamid Karzai signed off this bill in July 2008, despite making a firm commitment that he would not do so. However, an important component of the action plan, which was mapping of the conflict from 1979 through 2001, was undertaken by the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission with great audacity. Regretfully, the findings of this historic and, compar and, com and comprehensive national mapping were never made public. The third phase of efforts for inclusion of victims started as negotiation between the US and the Taliban had earned greater momentum. Different actors have taken different approaches. The Afghan government has been swinging between engaging and rejecting the war victims. It is a first largely involved symbolic meetings with certain victims and victim support organization on ad hoc basis in the absence of an overarching strategy. As far as the civil society in particular, the Afghanistan Human Rights and Democracy Organization and the transitional justice coordination groups are concerned, we have been advocating for a direct participation of victims in key peace institutions. In this respect, we have produced a position paper which provides a roadmap on how direct participation can be done in practice. We have engaged with key national and international actors, trying to convince them for a robust involvement of victims in the peace negotiation process. Our modality of victims involvement shares certain commonalities with the Colombian model of victims participation, but it is not similar as it advocates for direct participation in actual negotiation. There is a genuinely victim-centric and a call for a victim-centered durable peace, 
peace building. This model is the reflection of more than one decade of our engagement with various victims groups. Without direct participation and involvement of victims, sustainable peace building would not be possible as the victims are the most important constituency. We have to learn lesson from comparative experiences and this time you must stop treating victims as subject matter of our discussion and let the victims to speak for themselves as the key peace building constituency. Obviously this approach needs extensive technical support by the Afghan civil society and international allies. And given the time limitation, I, I'm stopping here and I would be very happy to explain further to this modality should there be a need in my next intervention throughout the seminar. Thank you, Hadi. Um, you mentioned about some of the technical support that you're trying to achieve for this modality, but what are some of the difficulties in managing the politics of inclusion um, of victims in the current process? Well, there is a tragic saying in Afghanistan and it holistically captures the politics of in victims inclusion. And it goes this way. If you kill one person, you end up in prison. And if you kill dozens, you will get the chance to become key power brokers. The more you kill, the greater your reward will be. The key issue is recognizing that without breaking such a vicious cycle, peace neither be built nor maintained. At the moment, many actors, including the Afghan government and certain international actors are unwilling to break this vicious cycle. Victims and issues of victims are still being seen as impediment to peace building rather than as a key component of peace building. The departure point is a strategic change in the, v and, in the way we think about victims and their impacts on peace building. We have to transition intellectually from seeing victims as impediment to peace building to looking to victims as an active agent of sustainable peace building. Furthermore, there is a lack of a strategic framework on the part of the Afghan government to involve victims in peace building. Victim issues are complex, ad hoc and symbolic engagement are inadequate. Therefore, lack of recognition of victims as a key constituency and absence of a coherent strategic framework for the inclusion of victims are the most difficult challenges we face now. I insisted a lot and so did a lot of uh, human rights activists and civil society organization on Afghanistan on the direct participation and representation of the victims in the process. Why there must be a victim representation. There are three important reasons that victim representative and victim specific agenda items must be included in the Afghan peace negotiation. First, numerically, victims make one of the largest constituencies in Afghanistan. More than 100,000 civilians have been killed and wounded since 2009 alone. Before 2001, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission estimates that the number of victims stands at more than 2 million, while the Afghan government statistics cites the number of pre-2001 war victims at around 1.5 million. And if victim is defined as someone who has lost a family member or who has cared for a wounded family member, and then had to deal with the emotional, mental, financial, and safety related consequences of that reality, then this could include nearly the entire population of Afghanistan. If, there's, if there is to be a comparison between the size of victims population and those of any Afghan political group that has got a seat at the negotiation table, regretfully the numerical strength of the victims con constituency will be far bigger than any other constituency that the Afghan elites claim to represent. Victims are one of the most important constituencies that must not be excluded. Second, the victims and their families have suffered the harshest realities from the war. They have lost their loved ones, they have been wounded physically and mentally, and have lost properties and their valuables during the conflict. They are in the best position to explain what has been lost, the deep impact of the loss, that loss, how Afghans can possibly be made whole again. Victims walk among us, their pain and loss hang in the air in Afghanistan. Unless and until their experience is solidly part of the conversation, our country will not be successful in any negotiation. They deserve to be at the negotiation table. It is shocking that they are not there. Victims need to be at the negotiation table to explain what suffering means.
what losing a loved one means, what it means to live a life with several children without having a breadwinner. Bringing these actual experiences of the cruelties of war to the negotiation table will inject a different spirit to the negotiation environment. If the negotiation do not substantively consider and account for the experiences of this particular constituency, then the work will be incomplete in any deal and from this negotiation will not be possible. And this takes me to my third point, victims participation will be transformative. It will have transformative impact on the negotiation process because nothing else highlights the urgency of ending the war as the stories, his, histories and narratives of the victims. It will be transformative because it will help, it will help the negotiators develop a more holistic understanding of the scope and magnitude of the sufferings the conflict has brought about, which could engage a change of behavior during the negotiation in the favor of the victims and peace building. More importantly, victims participation could be self-transformative too, helping the war victims feel psychologically healed and relieved. It could help the victims develop a sense of ownership of the peace process. This will create greater legitimacy and support in the peace negotiation, which is essential to any peace building processes and particularly sustainable peace building processes. The healing of victims will also translate into the broader healing of all Afghans. Many Afghans suffer from survivor's guilt and fairness and considering the harm to the most impacted group of Afghanistan will permit the healing of everyone in the Afghan society. These are the reasons why we strongly believe that victim participation is imper imperative for the peace process in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you, Hadi. And now I'd like to turn to Shahrzad Akbar. Um, as Hadi had mentioned, the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission has played quite a, quite a role in transitional justice from 2001. And he's also discussed some of you know, the challenges around the politics of inclusion. Would you be able to give us a little bit more about how and why the voices of victims have been marginalized in the current process and how you think it's, and how you see the importance of victims' um, inclusion in this current process? Um, Thank you, Marika. I'm very honored to be part of this panel and to be joining this very important and timely uh, conversation. Um, on victims' inclusion, um, so we, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, we look at every step in the peace process from a human rights perspective. So we look at every decision that's being made um, between the parties and evaluate um, the human rights aspects of that decision and the consequences, both from a process um, perspective, but also from a substantive uh, uh, perspective. Um, so far in the in the process um, in Afghanistan with the peace process, as, as you all know very well, in the first phase of the process, that was the engagement between the Americans and the Taliban. Afghans were not even in the room and they were not uh, included or consulted in any way. And um, the agreement didn't really refer much uh, to um, issues and concerns that Afghans have brother, Afghans have and um, human rights issues. However, one of the uh, points of agreement between Taliban and uh, um, uh, Americans has implications specifically for human rights, but also specifically for victims. That's prisoner release, the prisoner release process. Earlier before the agreement, when there was a release of Anas Haqqani, um, exchange, exchange of prisoners um, in which Anas Haqqani was released, uh, subsequently the commission made a public statement about um, the importance of any such decisions uh, considering the rights of victims and issues of victims. And later, with the this, uh, with the agree, with the U.S. agreement, uh, U.S. Taliban agreement being made public, the Commission released a paper, um, an open letter to Ambassador Khalil Zad um, and Afghan officials and Taliban officials asking questions about the prisoner release, also specifically bringing up um, issues related to victims' rights. So, if there are uh, specific victims that have been harmed by, by any of these people who, who are being released, what happens to their rights, and um, you know, are there people who are being um, detained um, on allegations of um, war crimes and crimes against humanity? And again, what happens with victims' rights in this process? Um, 
there was some informal response to our letter by the Afghan government and the Americans, nothing from the Taliban. However, it was an early indication of the fact that victims' rights is not a central issue for the parties, unfortunately, as Hodi also mentioned. We, following that, we continued to engage with them, uh, try to engage with both negotiating uh, teams because we think that victims' issues are human rights issues that both sides should really pay attention to. Um, Taliban haven't been very responsive, but the Afghan government uh, negotiating team, um, they have been somewhat responsive in engaging uh, with us, with the Commission on issues related to um, victims' rights. Um, however, the um, engagement, as Hadi also pointed out, has been ad hoc, um, and it could it could be it could be um, um, much better organized on their side. It could be much more um, strategic and much more clear. Um, there needs to be a lot more transparency as well on every step of the process, um, particularly when it comes to victims' rights. So right now, a few days ago, the Commission again released a letter about prisoner release and the remaining prisoners and issues pertaining to victims' rights. Uh, but also we have, uh, prior to that, we um, published uh, a proposal with four specific mechanisms that we suggested for victims' inclusion, from victims' testimonies, uh, where they would come and present to both sides to bring the suffering of war um, really to the fore and to bring their issues to the fore in their own um, language and, and they're using their own vocabulary and bring their own stories, but also nationwide consultations or some form of victims jerga, um, an expert reference group for the negotiating teams to engage with who would include um, um, experts from um, victims groups or representative, representatives from victims groups, as well as um, opening up the negotiation uh, process to written proposals on a variety of issues, including issues that pertain to victims' rights, from compensation to truth commissions to issues related to criminal justice. Um, we have put out these proposals to both parties. Um, we have engaged to some extent on some of these with the Afghan Republic's negotiating team and uh, people in the Afghan governments. Um, it has been a, a slow process. Um, we, uh, we will continue to, the Commission will continue to advocate for these issues, particularly for victims' rights and um, victims' um, concerns um, and victims' issues to be part of the agenda of um, the discussion. Thank you, Shahrzad. With the four mechanisms that you mentioned, they encompass the larger victim-centered approach um, that the Afghan Independent Human Rights uh, Commission has conceived. Have, has the Afghan Independent Rights uh, Human Rights Commission, will they be playing a role in this process as an independent actor? And are there sort of challenges um, and opportunities there that you see? So uh, the commission hopes to be an independent observer of the process, the peace process, from a human rights, from broader human rights perspective, including, uh, of course, issues related to, to victims' rights. We will also hope to provide experts. We have offered already, and we have had requests to expert uh, to provide expert advice on a um, range of issues related to the peace process and um, and human rights, particularly on victims' rights. We hope to. Um, um, provide consultations to both sides if they are interested on a range of mechanisms. So what could reparations look like in Afghanistan, for instance, because the commission has worked on a draft reparations law. Uh, what could a truth commission look like What and other aspects. In terms of the four mechanisms that we have proposed, our idea was to open the space for organizations like HRDO and other uh, victims organizations to really come to, this, uh, to the fore of these discussions. Our preference is that we would be uh, advising on the criteria, for instance, on victims' testimonies, our preference would be to advise on the criteria for selection rather than be directly involved. We would prefer organizations that work much more closely with the victims directly, like HRDO and other organizations who do this work as members of transitional justice group to be involved because they have um, long-standing long -standing relationships with victims of various forms of conflict. Of course, also in our definition of victims, uh, it's important that this is something that the negotiating teams will also have to think about. When we talk about victims, we talk about the victims of conflict for the past 14 years, but for the past 40 years, but so uh, 
when it when it um, relates to this particular negotiating um, uh, table, discussions around this negotiating table, would it be victims of um, the past 20 years or, or, or would it be a more broader understanding of victims? What we are very clear on is, however, that when we talk about victims, we are talking about victims of all um, kinds of conflict-related violence that includes airstrikes, that includes nitrates, um, that includes um, uh, suicide attacks, um, the, the um, kind of the people behind um, this, this victimization could be international forces, the Afghan government or Taliban. We are very um, anxious also about politicization of the issue of victims. We don't want it to be an issue that's seen as an issue uh, just for the government because we think it's a broader issue. It has the potential, in fact, to create common ground between the two negotiating teams because there is a shared experience of victimhood um, in different parts of Afghanistan and in the hands of different actors. So the challenge moving forward would be uh, America is how do we really mobilize, how do you first get the both parties to agree to um, listening to victims, um, to victims' testimonies, to these mechanisms that we have proposed. And once both sides agree, then the, uh, of course there will be a specific, as we know from the experience of other kinds will be challenges and implementation as well. Um, issues of representation are always thorny and difficult in any context, especially in a context that's as diverse as Afghanistan. Uh, but we hope that once, if if we get enough, um, if we get the international community and the Afghan people and Afghan civil society to use their leverage to put pressure, especially on Taliban, to agree to inclusion of victims in the process, that then we have enough expertise in the Afghan civil society and connections and mobilization to then use that opportunity, that window, to bring victims' issues to the fore, to the negotiating table. Thank you, Shahrzad. Um, I'd love to bring in Sergio now into this conversation, who's worked very much on these issues. What was the role of victims in the Columbia peace process, and how do you see how it impacted the process and the outcome? Um, well, <clears throat> thank you very much, America, and thanks to the Council for the invitation. Um, Afghanistan and Colombia uh, naturally could not be more, more different countries. They're like different planets. But the one thing they do have in common is the great suffering of the people through the violence and the number of victims. I mean, the Colombia's conflict, for those who don't know, lasted 50 years, uh, had more than 8 million IDPs, around 300,000 dead, about 100,000 um, forcibly disappeared of all kinds. Um, so it seems to me that th the key thought to me is that if you have a long and so-called intractable conflict, and this obviously applies as well for Afghanistan, because, I mean, the, the figures you see from the UN are from 2009, but most people count the conflict as lasting 20 or probably actually 40 years, that it was just said. If you have a, a, a long intractable conflict, then what you want to do is not just end the war, but you want to, as, as Hadi said, you want to break the cycles of violence. So your leading principle should be the principle of non-repetition. This is actually what you're aiming for. And I have to say that from what I know, the position of the African Republic today is exactly that. And if you're serious about non-repetition, then there's nothing more important than the victims. You need to address victims' rights if you are going to be serious about non-repetition. I also think myself that it's um, not possible to do a, a serious and legitimate negotiation in the 21st century if you're not listening uh, to the victims, because the victims are today present in a way in which they were not before. In the case of Colombia, I will just run through very quickly with the time we have from some of the basic elements. There was an important background before we started the negotiation. President Santos had already got a law through Congress in 2011, which was a very ambitious reparations law. Colombia actually established the biggest, the largest reparations program in the world in 2011. And with that background, we went into secret talks with the FARC in 2012. And as we were discussing the agenda, we said to the FARC, look, there is no way we can start a peace process in Colombia today if there's not a point on the agenda on victims and victims' rights. This, so far as I know, had actually never been done before. I mean, there have been agreements that included elements of human rights and so forth, but not a point specifically on victims. And we actually had as one of the five substantive points of our agenda, which were all defined, by the way, by this concept of non-repetition, 
One was precisely the point on victims. And after much argument, the, the FARC agreed. And this meant, I think, uh, a very important change of perspective. The negotiation not, it's not just about warring parties agreeing to something, is about also listening to the victims. And to the victims, this is a very important point, which I'm about to make, the victims of all the parties. And there there was, there was a very courageous decision by President Santos to say, we're going to put also our victims on the table. Whoever may have been a victim of a state actor is also part of the deal we are talking about because it's all about non-repetition. And in this way, the victims became what I call really the, the moral center of the peace process in Colombia, the, the, the main source of energy, in my view, uh, a great source of support, but also uh, put a lot of responsibility on us to, to, to be serious about what we were doing. And what we did, I would just summarize briefly in three things. The first was to guarantee adequate victims' participation, which meant um, first we organized with the help of the UN and of the main university in Colombia, and you can actually ask the UN to tell you about this in Kabul or get somebody to tell you. We organized for each, each time we had a point on the agenda, we were negotiating in Havana, as you might now in Doha or wherever, uh, but, but we wanted to make sure that, that the citizens we could participate. So the UN and the, and the main uh, public university in Colombia organized these conferences for each point to bring in together proposals. When we got to victims, we realized it, was, it wasn't enough to do one conference, so we actually did four all over the country. That was the first change. But that even that did not seem adequate. It, we needed more. Um, so we came up with the idea of inviting uh, five delegations of 12 victims each to the negotiating table, that the victims would be chosen by the church with the UN and the university, uh, applying criteria of pluralism and equilibrium. So they had to be adequately represented from all sides. And we were hands off. We said, you choose the victims. And they came in these very solemn ceremonies and spent over a period of four months, about every two weeks, we would have a, a delegation come from Colombia and we would spend a whole morning just listening to them. And the center of the whole event were the 12 victims, each one giving us their views, making proposals, but naturally also relaying their experience. Sadly, we didn't record any of this because we didn't really want to send the wrong message, but it was really the most powerful thing in the whole peace process. It really reminded us all why we were there. And the victims were treated in a very respectful way. And one of them, who's become a friend of mine, said to me years later, actually in Brussels, uh, he said, you know, when I went to Havana and, and went into this room and saw the delegations rise of the government and the park, and the church and everyone and the, and the Norwegians and the Cubans, I realized this process is serious. This is, this is the real thing, um, which was a, a nice thing to hear, and it was true. So first participation. Second thing was that we made addressing victims' rights really the measure of an adequate response and justice in a negotiation. And people talk about transitional justice very easily, but, but actually, the issue of how to, how to address victims' rights and do justice in negotiation is not something that has been, in my view, adequately explored, and it is a very, very hard thing to do. So if you say, look, we're going to concentrate not so much on the perpetrators, we're going to concentrate first on the victims and what the victims need. And the needs of the victims, by the way, are not homogeneous. The, some victims want more one thing, other victims want more of other things. But with the standard, uh, list, let's call it, of the right to truth, justice, reparations, and non-repetition, you, you, you cover more or less the ground. And you say, okay, this is what we're going to concentrate on. This actually makes the negotiation psychologically easier because you're not telling your counterpart, we're now discussing what's going to happen with you in terms of justice and how many years you're going to go to prison. We're going to discuss first what the victims want and what the adequate mechanisms are. And so we set up a, a what we call the comprehensive system 
elaborate. The first time also that in a negotiation he had uh, an agreement that created a new tribunal, a truth commission, a special unit to look for the forcefully disappeared. And the job of all these institutions is to precisely address this broad range of rights. And, it, and they do so by creating a system of incentives. So whereby if you actually go before this tribunal and tell the truth, then you get a much reduced sentence under special conditions. And if you don't, then you get the ordinary uh, sentence. Um, this is actually also the first time you have an insurgency going before a tribunal as a product of a negotiation, which shows it's possible. It, it can be done. Now, at the same time, one cannot be naive. And the situation in Afghanistan is, is very, very complex today. Um, I wouldn't get, if I may say so, too desperate yet, because in my view, if you, if you call the peace process the negotiations, strictly speaking, it hasn't, I mean, one always talks about a peace process in Afghanistan, but strictly speaking, this hasn't started. What you've had is a negotiation between the Americans and the Taliban, which is something else. So you still have time to structure things in a way which is satisfactory for the victims. And um, I would also look at, because this is going to be a, a really very difficult thing to do, uh, the first step we took before we created this rather complex edifice of institutions and things, which you may not want to do straight away, was to agree on a set of principles, of 10 principles, that would guide the negotiation. I think this actually would be quite a good thing for Afghanistan. So, for example, we agreed that the first principle would be uh, acknowledgement of the victims in their, in their rights and as citizens, acknowledgement Number two, acknowledgement of responsibility by the perpetrators as a, as a guiding principle. So we all agree we're each we're going to acknowledge whatever responsibility uh, 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 corresponds to us. And third, we're going to jointly address victims' rights and make sure there is no... And this is actually a phrase the FARC came up with. You see how, how much of a process this was. There's no exchange of impunity. This is not about exchanging impunity. It's about addressing victims' rights and so forth. And there's a longer list. So this actually created a joint, a shared language, which you could use. And then you could see how far you could get. And I think in the case of Afghanistan, it's going to be complex. It's going to take a long time. But there's no reason why you cannot start working on those principles now. And finally, to finish, um, this whole system of addressing victims' rights was itself embedded in, the, in a larger set of measures which were a product of the agreement, which again had its own logic of non-repetition. For example, a very ambitious uh, program was agreed to on rural development, which also had a logic of non-repetition. And, and it's, act, it's actually this, exactly the same things in Afghanistan because they had very similar problems of poverty in the periphery of drug cultivation and so forth. And but here, the important point here is that you also need to think about those who are not direct victims of violence, but who nevertheless suffered. So for one person who was forcefully displaced, you may have a family who decided not to displace themselves, but who suffered terribly by staying where they were. So we agreed to this quite ambitious uh, programs we called rural development programs with the territorial approach of which there are 16, which are now working in Colombia and have had so far about 250,000 people participate in a participatory planning process. And the logic of these programs is obviously a developmental uh, uh, program, but also there's a strong element of reparations and, and a strong element of sending a message of acknowledgement that he has suffered because of the war. So we're not just worrying about the people who were direct victims of the violence, we're worrying about entire regions that suffered because of the violence. And so it's a holistic approach, but not in this kind of tra -la -la, uh, kind of rhetorical sense, but in a concrete sense of designing measures that are going to respond to the individual victims, but also to the regions that suffered the most. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Sergio. I just wanted, um, that was really helpful in thinking about some of the lessons that can be applied in the Afghan context. One of the, um, a couple of the points that Hadi and Shahrzad raised was about the, how the politics of including, you know, the difficulty of the politics of including victims, especially in a context where these are very, you know, there's been a series of very elite deals. Um, did some of the, I, you know, and in Afghanistan in particular, it's taken on ideological dimensions, um, sort of the narrative around peace 
and so forth. Did the ideological differences between the FARC and the Colombian government add any unanticipated difficulties in pushing for transitional justice? Like how did, um, in order to come up with that shared language of the concept of non-repetition before including um, victims? Uh, it was an extremely difficult thing to do. I'm not saying that this is a, a, a walk in the park as the Russians say, this is really very, very difficult. It took us a, an entire, um, it's actually the main reason why the negotiation ended up being so long. It took us a year and a half just to negotiate the point on victims because it required getting the FARC to accept that there was no other way but to respond to the victims. And this actually was an effort that included many people, not just us talking to them, because obviously we were their counterparts, so we were not, you know, they weren't going to believe us exactly. So there were people around uh, close to the FARC. There were some kind of the Norwegians who were facilitators played a very important role, uh, creating a group of people who advised the FARC and um, it's, it's said to them, look, you know, in the 21st century, as we said, but, you know, they had more authority. Uh, you, you know, you, there's, there's just no way you can just do an old fashioned amnesty. It's just not going to work, which was actually our basic position as a government is there's not going to be a blanket amnesty in Colombia. That's off the table. We, we can come up with all kinds of things, but not a blanket amnesty. Uh, the last thing I will say is that I, because um, sometimes in Afghanistan there's some kind of complex ideas about delegations, and I, I actually, if you ask me, I don't think victims should be part of the of the delegation. What victims should have is a place at the table as victims, because they need to address everyone. They shouldn't be with one side against the other side. They should be there expressing their demands as victims. And that's what actually was extraordinarily effective in, in the case of in the case of Colombia. Thank you, Sergio. Um, now I'd like to turn to some of the questions from our audience members. Um, I'd like to ask Hadi, and uh, what is what, what do you view civil society's role in pressuring stakeholders in the peace process to pull victims' voices into the negotiations? Sergio mentioned how you know one of the ways that it happened in Colombia was by the multiple stakeholders that were able to bring to bear some pressure. Um, how do you see that um, you know evolving in Afghanistan? I think you're on mute. Yeah, uh, I just unmuted myself. Uh, well. There are a number of things that the Afghan civil society can do. And uh, I think the first one is there is a need for a technical working group on issues and involvement of victims in the peace negotiation, which should consist of Afghan civil societies, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, and the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, and as well as you know the international bodies. This group should both engage with the victims' parties and victims uh, uh, during the negotiation process, and this is because victim issues, as all of us are, you know, all of us know, and as uh, Sergio also uh, mentioned, are very complex. And in order to develop victims' agenda properly and, and effectively engage with the conflict parties, there is a need for such a technical and authoritative coordination body. Uh, the second thing that I, uh, you know, can say that the Afghan civil society and their supporters can do. Is, is, is very much connected to the very, you know, to the first point is the development of a justice and accountability framework as a part of the peace agreement, where there is a technical support and co coordination, where the technical support and coordination body can play a very important and vital role. And equally important is the development of an implementation plan for justice and accountability framework in post-peace agreement environment. So these are some of, you know, the concrete, you know, uh, 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 suggestions, you know, and, and, and roles that the, the Afghan civil society can play out through, you know, the process. But I don't know how much time I have, but I would like to also mention, you know, that, you know, these are some of the things that we have been trying, you know, already in the context of Afghanistan, you know, to achieve some of these benchmarks uh, that we have set as far as the victims' uh, participation in, uh, uh, and inclusion is concerned. And Sharzad also mentioned one very important thing is, is about also the process, uh, the modality itself, but more importantly also about the criteria, you know, to, to, to select the victim's representative for 
you know, the uh, process of negotiation, either to directly participate or be, you know, or indirectly, indirectly participate in the form of testimonials, in the form of, you know, having a, a seat at the table, you know, to, 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 to raise the issues and concerns of the victims to the peace negotiators. So, and I think, you know, again, as, as, as one thing that Sergio mentioned, this particular modality that we have been advocating for is, is not something new. It has been tried and tested in many different contexts, and particularly in the context of Colombia. So, and it reflects, you know, what we're actually uh, a, proposing, you know, our modality is, is, is as a civil society, and of course, as a as Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, and Sharzad might talk more about, you know, the, these modalities. It reflects successful international examples of sustainable peace building. Comparative studies of peace negotiation and peace agreements have found a strong correlation between sustainability of peace and the degree of participation by civil society and victims of war in the peace negotiation process. To just give you one example, you know, I study of eight, a study of 83 peace agreements in the post-Cold War environment has shown that participation of civil society and victims in the peace process has reduced the risk of resumption of violence by 64% among the primary conflict actors and by 50% among the secondary conflict actors. And there is also another study has looked at 20% agreements over, over a period of 15 years. This study found the higher involvement of civil society and victims with peace process led to sustainable peace building. Medium involvement of civil society and victims led to mixed results, sustainable and filled peace and lower or no involvement of civil society and victims in the peace process led to the collapse of peace agreements. So we need to actually look at the international examples and learn some lessons from other comparative, let's say, contexts. And in particular, you know, as Sergio mentioned, an illustrative case of victim participation is the Colombian peace process. And this is something, you know, that we have recently experienced and that showed that it is actually possible to include victims in the process where of course we had, you know, the victims, you know, that provided their testimony, testimonies. And then it also, the, you know, so these are all what we're actually as, 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 as contributing, of course, you know, to the literature, to the understanding and to the bringing these examples, all are, you know, what we as a civil society is trying to play and, and to bring forward basically and our, play our role. And then as far as the process is concerned, because it's also very key questions, you know, everyone might be asking what does actually victim participation in the peace process look, will look like? We fully anticipate the environment for peace negotiation will be very tough and it will be dominated by a very highly polarized negotiation elites. Under such difficult circumstances, we strongly believe only substantive and participation in inclusion of victims has the potential to guarantee victims' interest in the negotiation process. And then, having said that, you know, two other, you know, or let's say, Three issues are quite important here. First, a substantive, you know, direct or indirect participation means victims have actual representation in the peace process and the negotiation team and the higher reconciliation council uh, uh, body uh, uh, that, that will be established in Afghanistan and later victims affairs technical committee in the and the ministry of peace. This would mean two, you know, let's say at least, you know, two, one male and one female individual on the, you know, to be participating to be present at the table, which is currently composed of 20 people, but there is not a single victim's representative. And the second inclusion on the actual team, this needs to be complemented by a second layer of participation, which Sharzad already talked about that, which is it's testimonial by a larger number of victims in smaller groups before the negotiation team, but also in the higher reconciliation council. And essentially what we're actually aiming, you know, that a group of, you know, let's say, 50 or more than that, maximum to 100, you know, victims would provide testimonials uh, to the negotiation table and high reconciliation council would be the audience to these testimonials and would have the opportunity to engage directly with the victims group through question and answer session after the testimonies. This will provide a solid platform for many victims uh, you know, to share their experience of victimization as profoundly as they can with the negotiators and the broader Afghan elites comprising the, uh, the Reconciliation uh, Council. And the experience will shape not only how the victim's representative will engage in the peace negotiation, but will also hopefully inform the way other participants should and will approach 
you know, those negotiations. So these are all, you know, some other, you know, um, uh, work that the Afghan civil society as part of the facilitation, you know, coordination, organization, and mobilization of the victims, you know, to become part of the process and to become the part of the testimonies are concerned. And we are already the Afghan civil society, and more importantly, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission is, is significantly contributing to this process. And the last, Thing is that you know Shahzad mentioned, and I'm sure that she will she will be also coming back to this point, and that is how we actually you know aiming to choose let's say the victims' representative. The final and and this is of course a very key question, and that how victims and and, and, and victims' testimonials you know will be uh, uh, will be chosen. This must be done through a democratic and representative process in order to ensure the legitimacy and success of the participation. This is to have a popular mandate on behalf of victims. The representative of the victims has to be chosen through a democratic consultative and transparent processes. And unfortunately, when I before mentioned, you know, this is something that the Afghan government has to do yet. You know, they have to do more consultation and they have to go, you know, actively uh, reach, and reach out, you know, to the victims and, and do that. But instead, you know, it is actually the Afghan civil society and the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission is planning to do or doing already this one. And then some of the existing members of the negotiation, you know, team, as all of you know, you know, have lost loved one in the course of the conflict. And many members of the yet to be established High Reconciliation Council might likely be victims too. But can they represent the victims? The answer is no, for two reasons. One is first, only the victims chosen through a representative process can be deemed to represent the interests of victims as a group as opposed to their individual representation based on their individual experiences. And I think, again, what Sergio mentioned in the case of Columbia, and that is a clear, you know, let's say, testimony that it is actually the victims themselves, you know, that they were there and, and, and speak on, uh, for themselves, if, even in the form of testimonies. Second, when an individual who is also victims comes to the table with their mandate being to be representative of victims, that is entirely different than someone, you know, having also been a victim. It will be the substantive responsibility of the specific victim representative to ensure that the specific interests of victims as a groups are represented. And here is how we propose that democratic consultative process of selecting victim representative to take place, you know, and Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, the Transitional Justice Coordination and the Afghanistan Human Rights and Democracy Organization in the lead will organize a national victims jerga or, 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 or grand assembly, we call it, and we hope to bring you know, as many victims as possible to this national jerga so that you know, we can establish you know, the specific needs of these victims. And then in addition to that, there is also a plan to elect a 10 member victim peace task force. And this peace task force will represent the victims in key peace institutions and engage as a victim's representatives with the civil society, the government, international actors, and the broader the Afghan uh, you know, public to communicate their message and mobilize cross-cutting support for the realization of this agenda. And so these are, you know, some of the things, and as I mentioned, you know, that the Afghan civil society, uh, the Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission is already doing, but what is actually lacking at this stage is an active engagement and a more systematic engagement by the Afghan government and also some of the international actors, you know, to help this agenda and, you know, this, uh, objective is met. So thank you, and I, I and I talked a lot. <laughs> thank you, Hadi. Now that was very helpful. Um, I'd like to turn to Shahrzad and Sergio. Um, people talk a lot about the tension, and Hadi mentioned this earlier about the tension between peace and justice, um, especially you know when inclusion has been defined so far as bringing in primarily armed actors into the process. Um, how do you see the what concrete steps Shahrzad? do you think can be taken to push for a victim-centered approach in a way that, um, uh, you know, is palatable or in a way that is not only palatable, but in a way that is productive um, when you have such an elite driven process? Thank you, Maika. Uh, I think there are, there are two, two issues that of course um, help each other. One is the victims issues, the other is victims participation in the process. And of course they are interrelated, but we want to make sure that we put victims issues at the center of the discussion um, to the extent that possible, regardless of the composition or the structure of the uh, different structures from the negotiating team to other different structures that are um, being set up um, to um, advance the peace process. 
In terms of the concrete steps, the first step from our perspective is that there are some ideas now out there in the public sphere. We have put some proposals out, as I explained before. Um, the Transitional Justice Coordination Group has a very specific position on direct representation of victims in the negotiating team. Ours is more focused on victims' testimonies and providing input and having victims' issues on the agenda. These proposals are out in the public sphere. The, the next logical first step um, and helpful first step would be for the both sides to agree on which mechanisms they want to move forward with. Because we think that in the, uh, in the commission, we think that if we want this issue to be really, be really taken seriously, um, both sides have to agree to it. Similar to the Columbia experiences, but also other experiences, you have to have both sides to agree to a set of mechanisms and also agree which actors they are comfortable with to be engaging on implementing these mechanisms. So there has to be an agreement on that issue. And this is what we have been pushing for is directly talking to Taliban, but also asking international community to use its leverage to pressure um, Taliban to engage on these issues with the commission with other, with, and with the civil society on issues of human rights and on issues of uh, victims engagement. So the mechanisms are out there. Once both sides agree on which mechanisms they are willing to adapt jointly, then, then the civil society can mobilize to help the implementation of that mechanism. Say both sides agree to victims' testimonies. Both sides agree that similar to Columbia, they want, to, they want victims to come in and speak to them. Um, then there can be a whole process around that and we can bring the voice of the victims directly to the table. If both sides agree to a set of principles, this is another thing that we are working in the commission on. We are working on a kind of draft of principles to be shared with both sides and also the Afghan civil society. Uh, we, are th we, we think that that can also create some common grounds um, uh, and some common language on talking about issues of victims. Um, meanwhile, it came to kind of have a public discussion about victims and victim-centered justice. The public discussion of Hanson about transitional justice has been very narrow, unfortunately. The public understanding of transitional justice is criminal justice. And this usually creates more panic and anxiety in this discussion of peace versus justice, rather than a victim-centered approach, which as Sergio also, as Sergio also explained, is focused on not trying to find people to punish, but on actual humans that have suffered during the war and their needs and their concerns and their demands and their voices. So in the commission, we are trying to do a lot of work to bring the focus, the spotlight to the victims themselves, and also to discuss with both negotiating teams about the fact that when we talk about victim-centered justice, we are talking about a whole range of mechanisms, not just criminal um, justice. So continuing to build on this conversation, continuing to get both sides to talk to each other about these issues, to find common ground, continuing to engage different stakeholders. For instance, in the commission, we are also consulting religious scholars to tell us about the Islamic perspective on transitional justice. What transitional justice mechanisms, when you look at them from an Islamic perspective, how, how uh, what makes sense and what doesn't and what could be re reframed. And so that's also some, some, uh, some public communication work that needs to um, happen to actually, um, I think, unpack this discussion a little bit more for everyone involved um, would be, um, I think could contribute to the peace process. Wonderful, thank you. And now I'd like to turn to Sergio for the last word as we're ending soon, just to reflect a little bit on the um, question on the tensions from Colombia and how you see this potentially applied in Afghanistan. Um, would it be palatable to bring in a more victims or justice centered approach in, in a context like Afghanistan, both for the uh, Afghan Republic side as well as for the Taliban side? Well, this is a hugely complex and difficult issue, as I said. And, um, uh, uh, the first thing you need to say is that there is a real problem. There's a real tension. Uh, it, it's easy to say, to so kind of write an academic paper and say, oh, you yeah, know, it's all compatible, but it's actually not the case. It's it's a very difficult issue. Now, if you start a negotiation with the Taliban by saying, look, uh, the UN says you are responsible for 45% of civilian casualties and these commanders were responsible in these regions, therefore each one of them has to go for 40 years prison, well, you're not going to get a peace deal. Um, so what can you do? It, the point is it doesn't mean that then you have to go and say, okay, then well, let's just do a blanket amnesty. No. That's where you have to say, okay, stop. Let's worry first not about you, but about the victims and let's see what the victims want. 
and I think a, a lot of these things are not are not you know they're, they're codified in legal instruments, but they're universal needs. You know, everywhere in the world, anybody who suffered violence wants to know what happened, what happened to the loved ones, uh, wants acknowledgement as a victim, it wants to be taken seriously, wants a person who did the wrong to acknowledge that they did this wrong. And then there may be different uh, degrees to which people want some forms of punishment. That can change. Um, but I think that's what you need to have on the table. And what seems to me very important in Afghanistan now, we do seem to have another thing in common with Afghanistan and Colombia. We love also to create all kinds of structures and councils and things. But I would worry less about the bureaucracy and more about getting really a movement of people saying, look, this is not what we're doing. The peace process is not just a political negotiation about whether you have a uh, power sharing or whatever. It's also about what happened and what everyone did to us. And you need to respond for this. You need to be, you need to be accountable. And, um, the more, and so you need the pressure to build up uh, by having a greater consciousness in society that this is what is expected. So whatever you do with the negotiation, the minimum that's expected is that you respond adequately to victims' demands and victims' rights. Thank you, Sergio. That was a very nice way to wrap up the um, this conversation, especially on really pushing for a movement um, to push for victims' rights in addition to the uh, sort of the bureaucratic arrangements. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone, the Atlantic South, uh, the Atlantic Council South Asia Center for hosting this event, as well as to all our panelists for taking the time to join and share their insights with us. It was an extremely important and timely conversation. We hope it catalyzes a greater discussion over the role of victims in transitional justice, both in the Afghan context, but also more broadly in international conflicts. I also wanted to thank Sahar Halimzai of Time for Real Peace, who co-organized this panel, and to all the those who tuned in and submitted questions. If you're on Twitter, please join the conversation with hashtag Afghan Peace Process. And for more content on Afghanistan affairs, please visit the South Asia Center page. Once again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you.